I want to thank, like I said, thank everybody for coming out tonight to celebrate the official release of Thomas Townsley's book. I pray this letter reaches you in time. <clears throat> Uh, my name is William Welch. I'm the editor of Doubly Mad, which is a Utica, New York-based literary magazine and also uh, the publisher of, of Tom's book. Uh, for those of you who are new to our space and never been here before, this is the other side of Utica. It's a nonprofit community arts organization that hosts a wide array of artists, um, brings them here to the uptown Utica area. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to say that the art on the walls that you see around you this evening is part of our current exhibition, Elemental, and it's curated by Sandra Stevens. And I do want to ask that anyone sitting on this wall just be, be mindful of their inkjet print, prints, so uh, just try not to jostle them. Um, the uh, show brings together the work of Jean Proust, Erica Jagley, I hope I'm pronouncing that, pronouncing that right, uh, and Ailey Tyre. Uh, we have gallery hours, so if you would want to come in um, and see the artwork when you know you have a chance to really get close to it and, and observe it and the room's not crowded. Our gallery hours are on Thursdays um, and Saturdays 12 to noon. Uh, another thing that we have going on coming up is on April 1st, we have vibraphonist Joe Locke coming here. Uh, he's one of the best vibraphonists in the world. He's part of our, gonna be part of our jazz series. Um, this is really exciting. He's going to be joined uh, by uh, Mike Melito on drums, Rick Montabano on piano, and uh, Peter Trozic on bass. Uh, tickets are 25 bucks, 10 for students. Uh, if you would like to sign up for that, you can see me later. I can give you some, some information for how to get tickets. I want to thank CNY Arts and the Decentralization Fund of NISCA for granting support. Um, they help fund Doubly Mad and our jazz program and other events that we have here this, uh, throughout the month. Uh, for anyone who needs to use a bathroom, there is one here at the head of the stairs. Just knock Tom over, um, you know, and you just go right in and it's right there on the, on the left. And the last sort of housekeeping announcement, please consider supporting the other side with a donation before you leave tonight. In the back on the table, there's a jug, black jug. Um, we do not have any paid staff here. We rely on the support of of granting organizations and our friends to keep the lights on. So anything you could do, we appreciate. Um, just before we get started here, I want to say a few things. Probably everyone in the room knows Tom. If you don't, um, I will say, uh, give a short introduction. Uh, Thomas Townsley has a long list of artistic accomplishments. He studied at Shippensburg State College and Syracuse University. While in college, he began to play blues harmonica and developed a music career, opening for a bunch of national acts. As if that wasn't enough, for many years he hosted a radio show which garnered a wide audience in central New York, and he's also a skilled painter. So, wow, that's quite the list, you know. Uh, his main interest was really always literature, and I've always known him first and foremost as a poet. I met Tom roughly 10 years ago through a friend of mine who studied with him and played chess with him. And at the time, I was looking for writers who were willing to work with a small local press. And Tom had a man manuscript. Fast forward a decade, and Tom has released four full-length collections of poetry and a chapbook. I pre briefly want to share some of my impressions with you of Tom's work and why I've advocated for his poetry over the interval of 10 years. During this time, Tom has developed his own line of surrealism. As a literary genre or, or method, surrealism has often come under attack by critics and other poets in the US, even though it has had a pronounced impact on many of our writers. Just to give a famous example, which Tom himself likes to use, Wallace Stevens once opined that the essential fault of surrealism is that it invents without discovery. To make a clam play accordion is to invent, not to discover, end quote. The problem, one line of criticism asserts is that surrealism just creates sloppy nonsense, mixed metaphors, a teacher might say. The critic Marjorie Perloff condemned surrealism as a leap into a complete fantasy realm, focused on one's subjective self. Instead, Perloff suggests poetry should focus on accurate comparisons and images. 
But as Tom has argued in an unpublished essay called A Defense of Surrealism, the point of surrealist techniques is not to create an enigma. The surrealist image, he says, is extremely accurate. There is no sloppiness. There isn't necessarily a plunge into fantasy. The incongruity of images, things, people, incongruity is itself the point. It draws into question or reveals something hidden about what we assume is commonplace reality. For me, this is one of the aspects of Tom's work which makes it so successful. Often something may on the surface appear incongruous or absurd, and yet what he has written resonates in a way that other writing doesn't for me. And part of this resonance is ultimately earthy, phonic. What if we were really looking around us doesn't seem surreal about the world? Certainly in nature, we are confronted almost constantly with the bizarre, the uncanny, and the mismatched. Some of my favorite poetry draws energy from this earthy surrealism. It's present, for instance, even, I think, in William Blake. Think of the bafflement in the poem, The Tiger. Did he who made the lamb make thee? Again, incongruity. Another aspect of this resonance I sense in Tom's writing comes from the fact that there is deep emotion present in many of his poems, even the ones that seem mostly hilarious. And humor is one of his, his main weapons, you know. He's very funny. The comedic quality allows the sense of isolation through to me in a way that other work that is self-consciously plangent or lyrical does not. Just this morning, a friend of mine sent me an interview conducted with French filmmaker Robert Bresson, and of course I'm butchering the French, in which Bresson posits the aim of cinema as an art form is to explore intimacy and isolation. Certainly this is the aim of poetry as well, not all, but much poetry. And I think this is true of Tom's work as well. His poems are full of miscommunications, attempts to reach out, and a kind of solemn awareness that the gap between people seems unbridgeable. But again, this is often, if not always, hidden or obscured with humor. Like in these lines from my favorite piece in this collection, Summer on Neptune. Then I mentioned that we have no color red. The red wavelength is entirely absorbed by our atmosphere, making it hard to fall in love. On the surface, this is absurd, and yet at the core of the line is a fundamental incapacity that the speaker of the poem tries to excuse as the result of a physical property of Neptune, but which nevertheless I sense is both arbitrary and inescapable. Can the speaker of the poem not love because of the color of the light? No, there is an inherent problem of relation, and that problem is posed by the fact that we have to share our experiences with each other through language. The total effect of the piece is to make me wonder about the nature of communication. And with that, I think it's time to let Tom do some communicating. Please welcome Tom Townsley. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming out tonight, ladies and gentlemen and uh, for tuning in, YouTube folks. Um, thank you for that nice introduction, Will. Uh, I, I will second the motion that uh, you do what you can to support Doubly Mad and, and the other side, because uh, they're doing good things for the arts here in Utica. So I'm going to mostly read from the new book tonight, but I wanted to start off with... Uh, a poem that was included in this contemporary surrealist and magic realist uh, anthology, because I thought this would be a good, good place to begin. Um, it's called Big Tom's All Night Diner. Sal's frying orchids in the back, the hair on his knuckles, soon ready for harvest. The radio is tuned to the amnesia station. Maggie, the shy waitress, explains to table six that her life is governed by unremembered dreams, the invisible armature beneath all my decision-making, etc., etc. The man in the eye patch orders meteor showers. How long have you been here, alone at the counter? How long have you been one of the regulars? 
Now, as you watch a valent mist, the color of wet paper accumulates outside the window, dissolving the street, erasing every place from which you might have come. While in their corner booth, two young lovers who just ducked in to escape the rain read their menus silently without comprehension. And here's the menu. So um, I'm not going to do a whole lot of introductory, prefatory uh, material because we'll have a Q&A uh, session at the end of the reading. So I'm just going to sort of plunge into it. But I will just say briefly that uh, this book does, for me, mark a kind of culmination of various approaches um, to writing, to surrealism, to postmodernism and literary theory and uh, disguised autobiography that uh, I've been working on for, for some time. Um, so basically, uh, this book is, is more unified in, in terms of its formal approach probably than some of the previous books have been where I was still doing some apprentice work, I guess. Uh, but the book can also be divided uh, between poems that are somewhat narrative and poems that are very disjunctive. Uh, so I'll try to give you a mix of those things. And we'll start with a disjunctive one. Um, this is called, How Is Your Tuesday? A uniformed elevator operator from the 1940s sits on a footstool, muttering the word Vatic. A false prophet leaves something sticky in my inner ear. A woman who can be seen only peripherally says, last night's moon was a decaying tooth, which explains why lies are your foundation. Why don't you? But her voice is cut short by plummeting chandeliers. On a deserted beach, I seek another invisible hinge for my collection. A unicyclist reminds me to examine my choices carefully. When the salt vendor asks if I believe in love at first sight, I toss seven astrolabes into the sea, then forget what I was going to say. And just by way of slight contrast, uh, I will now read one that I think is a little more narrative. Uh, this is called The Problem With Me, number 117. Um, there's a, several Problem With Me poems in the book kind of scattered throughout, and I haven't begun to you know, uh, cover them all yet, so I'll probably keep working on these. But, but this is number 117. You are mentally colorblind, said the leprechaun. What do you mean, I said. There's nothing wrong with my vision. I see fine. For example, that jacket you're wearing is green. Of course it's green. I'm a leprechaun. Leprechauns wear green. Everyone knows that, the leprechaun said. Therefore, your statement proves nothing. Besides, I'm not talking about your external vision. I'm talking about your mind's eye. My what? I said. Your mind's eye, the leprechaun repeated. I believe it is subject to mirages. Tell me, what do you see right now? I looked up. Just then, a pair of acolytes turned past us on the street, carrying their brass candle snuffers, or emunctoriums, as the glossary of ecclesiastical ornaments calls them. But instead of wearing the traditional white robes, each youth was draped in what appeared to be a translucent shower curtain decorated with blue and green goggle-eyed fish. They must be late for services, I said. What are you talking about, the leprechaun snapped. Those acolytes, also known as extensors, I replied, pointing but when I looked again, all I saw was a middle-aged man in a jester's cap 
riding a unicycle with a rhesus monkey perched on his right shoulder. The monkey looked straight ahead, unfazed, as if it had done this many times before. The man, however, appeared to be weeping. Now do you see what I'm talking about? The leprechaun said. Your inner vision is untrustworthy. Maybe, but why, I asked, turning to face him. Of course, the leprechaun was no longer there. I couldn't even remember how to spell leprechaun anymore. Instead, an old woman looked up from her xylophone, which she'd set up along the curb right here on the street where I now realized I lived. Any requests, she asked. I stared at the mallets clutched in her knobby fists. They looked like birds of prey. Didn't I used to know you, I asked. I mean, like, a long time ago? You tell me, she said, but her expression didn't change. It remained stone-like, yielding no clues, not even after she launched into an expressive rendition of the shadow of your smile as gold lockets each bearing the singed hair of a different lover, began to drop from the trees into the mouths of waiting crocuses below. All right, I asked a couple friends uh, which poems they thought I should read from the book today, and uh, this is, I think, the winner. This is called The Lie. It's in three parts. One, what was the lie? Who told it? Did I really think it was wrong? Did it wash over us like air through a car window? Did it fall around us like the Perseid meteor shower? How many were affected by it? How many never caught on? And all the lies within the lie, like Russian eggs, did we take them into account? Or were we too absorbed in metonymic sidestepping and what they called verbal sashaying back in those Halicon days? That was before I learned to cure my stammer by parsing speech into musical phrases. Side effects include involuntary carnival barking and pleated dreams. Does my speaking of the lie make you uncomfortable? Would you prefer I spoke of the truth as if it too did not have its palimpsests? Who are you talking to, shouts Uncle Gestalt. He's been sniffing the pages of the latest poetry magazine and seems irritated. Take your ideal readers and get out of here. He shakes a knobby fist and scowls apropos of nothing. Or maybe it's the sight of us sprawled naked on the patio furniture. I swirl my gin and tonic. They're implied readers, if you must know, I say. <laughs> I don't care. I can feel their breath on my neck. No, you can't. That's a lie, too, I tell him. You and your lie. He rises from his chair and hobbles toward us, breathing black smoke. Don't you know that your so-called lie doesn't even exist, and that in itself is the lie? He begins to swat us with his copy of poetry, an issue devoted to formal metrical verse written by hemophiliacs. <laughs> One swing cracks me good across the brow. Ouch, that hurts. That's the idea, he says. Two, is it possible to lie without language? And with language, is it possible not to? Step right up, step right up. Did you believe the lie of the rose, the lie of starlight reflected in a pond, the lie of white birds upon a quaking bough? Did you believe the lie of capital? Did it cool your brow like a lover's kiss? And now, do you believe that every lie is a bridge and every truth a chasm? 
Do you believe William Butler Yates finally realized that Maud Gunn was a lie he told himself repeatedly, as I have come to realize regarding you? Are we the lies we choose to accept? That's a nice hat, by the way. I wish all of my inscribed readers wore hats like yours. <laughs> Would you like some galumpke? Aunt Prima Fassi made it from scratch. You all look so hungry, she says. Why do your readers look so hungry? What have you been telling them? Eat, eat. Aunt Prima Fassi, did you know that the Russians have no word for blue? Yet we consider it a primary color. How do you explain that? Stop your nonsense. Look at them. Poor things. Their ribs are showing. Eat, eat. I believe we are nothing's way of lying to itself. Three. Is everything we say or write a mirage? Is the truth what's left after all the lies have been told? From the next room, Uncle Gestalt shouts, You'll never know what it's like to bleed out over a poem. I have a mouthful of galumpke and do not answer. My model readers, however, begin to speak. The lie of the lighthouse beam, the lie of the stammering prophet, the lie of the bell tower smothered in ivy, and of the bell ringer waiting for a word. The lie of the cypress tree silvered by moonlight. The lie of the author. The lie of the wine stain on white silk. The lie of a lover beckoning from the terrace. The lie of the broken compass and the mystical honeycomb and the lute's broken string. Stop it, shouts Uncle Gestalt from the next room. What do any of you know? Imagine living with the knowledge that the next wound, even the slightest, could be fatal. A paper cut, even. That's the kind of thing to make a real poet out of you. Now, dear, leave them alone, says Aunt Prima Fassi. Look at them. Is it any wonder they believe in lies? Can't you see that they're starving? Thank you. The problem with me, number 152. As I ascend the stairs, I always pass myself coming down. I know very few sea yarns. I forgot to order that box of votive candles you wanted. What I thought was love turned out to be a sort of emotional flinching reflected in my syntax and in the nickname you gave me, Mr. Staccato. Mr. Staccato, why so many umlauts? Mr. Staccato, don't put starch in that. Mr. Staccato, what have you done with my paper punch? I've been told that my self-fascination is compensatory. Perhaps that is why I collect other people's pre-existing conditions and keep them in <laughs> glass display cases. I believe that butterscotch lozenges are the most emotionally distant candy, followed by nougat. When I say the word I, a cloud of squid ink erupts from my mouth. Have you noticed? Lately, I've observed that all my dreams have electric fences. Whether to keep me from getting in or getting out remains unclear. Thanks. So, uh, the next poem I read is a little bit longer, um, but I wanted to read this. It was another one that was requested, and it's probably one of my favorite poems in the book. Uh, Will mentioned it, in fact, in the introduction. It's called Summer on Neptune. Um, I wrote this one because I had sent some of the uh, other poems I wrote to a friend of mine from grad school. Um, down in Kentucky, and uh, he wrote back and seemed to be of the opinion that they were all sad love poems, which was news to me. Um, I mean, there were certainly threads of that there, so I thought, all right, you want a sad love poem? Here we go. <laughs> Though, of course, it's me, so it's 
you know, never going to make it on a Hallmark card. Um, but anyway, some are on Neptune. It's in six parts, one for each of Neptune's rings. One, it's summer on Neptune. Everyone's eating radishes. The horizon keeps blinking. Why won't you manifest, not even a little bit? Don't let those divining rods get in the wrong hands, says Fredder. You know what happened last time. Do I? I could go for a nice glissando right now. What rhymes with inchoate? What rhymes with unabated storm? From where you are, you'll need a small telescope to see us, so we're told. We have no coal on Neptune, but we have diamonds aplenty, though not the girl's best friend variety. We also have no ontology, no old women selling lint, no Pascalian wagers. Our marsupials aren't cute. Our songbirds appear rarely, for which we are grateful since they are harbingers of death. We earn our living watching pressure gauges. We send the data back home where some say it's recorded in a ledger. We've evolved to have a third eye, but it remains closed. What I wouldn't give for some snap peas. We have no word for adagio, no word for disambiguate. Sometimes our 14 moons befuddle us. Maybe that's why we count no higher than we need to. Our single epistle from Earth, a love letter handwritten on bleached parchment, is enshrined in the tourist center, now under renovation. Don't tell them about the feral children, whispers Fredder conspiratorially. Did I mention that we have no color red? The red wavelength is entirely absorbed by the atmosphere, making it hard to fall in love. I once saw a photo of a sumac tree from Earth. This experience resulted in mixed feelings and uneasy dreams. Therefore, I am led to believe that sensations exist about which no one has told us. Two. Captain Starview will be addressing you shortly with details of your mission. Please stand by. What rhymes with demythologize? What rhymes with albatross? Did you know that Neptune is the only planet in our solar system whose existence was predicted by mathematics prior to its discovery in 1846? Is it any wonder we've been chosen to monitor the gauges? Some would argue that physical objects can exist without ideas, but ideas can't exist without physical objects. Others, though admittedly fewer, would argue the opposite. We would prefer not to argue at all. Our celery has horizontal fibers. Our eels are bilingual, albeit telepathically. Who will comb the horizon's eyelashes beneath these fickle moons? Don't tell them about our peripheral vision, Fredder warns. Think of what they might do with such knowledge. I won't. Instead, I'll think of the sumac's tumescent seed pod with its blush of a harlot's lipstick. Did I mention that our dreams are perpendicular to yours? How this came about is hard to say, except to note that one cannot get here without first undergoing a state of suspended animation, the long-term effects of which we are only beginning to understand, like a loss of onomatopoeia or a fervent saltiness, or a refusal to manifest, all of which makes our relationship rather one-sided. Still, let no one accuse me of a priori thinking. Clearly, this memory of you has left an aftertaste, like lithium. I'm told our summers last 40 years, which should give us time to work things out. Meanwhile, let's all welcome the word redolent to our little colony. 
Your call is very important to us. We appreciate your patience. Captain Starview will be with you momentarily. I hope this doesn't take too long. I'd hate to miss the conversion ceremony. Three. We live amidst shades of blue, a color always in retreat. Our emotional palette ranges from cobalt to cyan, azure to cerulean during estrus. On Neptune, one year lasts two lifetimes, maybe yours and mine put together. Nothing here is completely opaque, except as the saying goes, the differences between us. Watching our narcissi bloom may lead to bouts of authorial intention, allegorically speaking. No one understands why the wind hasn't ground us to powder or the burning cold reduced each heart to a crystal. Don't practice your gaze in front of outsiders, warns Fredder, pointing to a figure on the horizon, or is it a reflection? According to my research, the sumac is considered an invasive species on Earth, capable of cloning itself by means of rhizomes, which form an elaborate underground root system. Cut it down in one place and it will spring up in another, like these images of you. Have I mentioned our six rings, far less satisfying than Saturn's? comprised primarily of space debris and regret. Do you think it is easy to maintain living conditions here at the edge of the solar system where the distance between ideas and physical objects is both razor thin and infinite? And having said that, do you think these gauges are accurate or that these graphs will take? Four. Please stand by. Captain Starview will soon be spinning the hits, laying down the platters that matter. I am with you, with the idea of you, my little horizon, here in the blue. I see you now with your face like 14 moons, illumined by a blue candle. I see you in your many phases, in your distances, in your play of light and shadow in the dark wing of night. I see a long line of exegetes trailing after you, interpreting each gesture. What would they make of the glissando of emotions you've caused me to feel? Would they dare affix a single word? What rhymes with convulsive? What rhymes with coagulate? How many years has it been since we touched, and Earth years or Neptunian years? Does this gravitational pull I'm still feeling connect me to an idea or a physical object? Don't ask them, Fredder hisses. How are they supposed to know? Besides, in exile, does it really matter? Now go recalibrate your gauges. Why wouldn't they know, I think to myself, but naturally I do as I'm told. I'm not yet ready to admit my growing suspicions that no one remembers we're here and that these gauges we watch perpetually aren't attached to anything. Five. Our midnight blue roses make a swallowing sound. Our dreams leave a residue that accretes the way stalactites do. We are studying your concept of irony, but we find it difficult to understand. Is this why we have no word for metalepsis? We have come to realize, however, that the horizon is neither a physical object nor an idea, strictly speaking. It is a necessary illusion marking a real limit of perception. We're forming a committee to study the phenomenon. Could it be that redness marks another kind of perceptual horizon and you another still? Don't extrapolate too much, warns Fredder, looking up from his plate of scallions. Don't try to make this into a closed text. Don't count your bruises. 
Don't close the narrative distance. Don't trim the narcissi. Don't touch that dial. Don't look up tidal locking, not with 14 moons. Don't pull the wool over my third eye. Don't leave any radishes unattended. Don't forget what brought you here. Or if you do, then don't forget that you've forgotten. These bruises may have occurred during transit, I tell him. Don't dwell on them, he says. They probably occurred while you were in suspended animation. Of course, I remember nothing of that. What I do know is, once I woke up in this blue world, I still remembered you. And that is how I remembered myself. How far I've carried both of those memories, or how far they have carried me. Fredder would probably warn me not to trust them. He'd explain how memories are subject to tricks. We gaze up at the 14 moons, strewn like scattered change across the sky. Is it time for the divining rods, I ask? Don't bring them out until the conversion ceremony has begun, Fredder says. By then, the outsiders will be gone. Only true Neptunians are permitted to observe it. At the mention of true Neptunians, I can feel my third eyelid begin to twitch. Six. Please stand by. Captain Starview is waiting in the wings with a message for all you gauge gawkers. What rhymes with heliotropism? What rhymes with parallel processing? The love letter from Earth reminds us that failure to manifest may be an essential ingredient of long-term emotional interest for certain personality types. Is this why I see you always in the distance where mirages dwell, holding a basket of snap peas? Some of us have come to understand that each perception is also an act of interpretation. Others still believe a true glissando is possible. It is hard to remember the specific events which brought us to this place, this blue condition, nor have we any way of recalling how long our suspended animation lasted or how we dreamed our way out of it since time here is no longer sequential. But it's summer on Neptune. This cold should be lethal, yet here we are. We have no first causes, no bank clerks in clown suits professing anagogy, no word for sublimate. Our escarole tastes metallic and our marsupials remain hideous. Our 14 moons will vex your dreams if you are still capable of having them. I would offer you more radishes, but the divining rods are picking up a signal. I believe the conversion ceremony is about to begin, and the rules are clear. Only true Neptunians may attend. Try not to stare directly at the feral children on your way out. Yes, and don't tell them about your scotoma, Fredder hisses, chewing on a leek. As he talks, little pieces of it spray from his mouth. Don't tell them that our rings are incomplete or that seeing them is a trick of perceptual closure. Don't tell them our myths are purely aesthetic. Don't offer them a symptomatic reading. Don't let on that desire must always be satisfied by symbolic substitutes for that which it cannot possess. Don't tell them about Captain Starview's club foot. Don't tell them what the Phoenician sailor means. Why would I do any of that, I wonder, as I am lowered onto a gurney? Someone is palpating my cephalic vein. Awake, my rhizomes, man the gauges. It's summer on Neptune. The horizon is blinking, and everything is redolent of you. Wow. How are we doing on time? Okay, I'll read uh, two more. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, then we'll do our Q&A. Q&A. All right. Well, 
The problem with me, number 74. <laughs> Time changed the lock on my youth. Under the Zeppelin's shadow, I contemplated the irreducibility of one heart's longing. I once believed that the living had an advantage over the dead in that the dead were unaware of their condition while the living were aware of theirs. Then I began to imagine there might exist an imponderable but pervasive force to which our living blinded us the same way death blinds the dead to consciousness. I became a chimney sweep. I mean, a Ferris wheel operator. I mean, a poet. <laughs> I made a sacristy of what I believed to be your eyes. When given the opportunity, I refused to sign on the dotted line, for the moment of a text's inscription marks a singularity that carries with it a fissuring a priori, or so they said in cosmetology school. I once held your hand in a sensory deprivation tank. I can never get enough manna. My pastimes include winking, buffing parabolas, extorting empiricists, and bleeding on faulty syllogisms. My imagined scenarios outnumber my real ones, 13 to 1. Hey there, dreamer, what are you dreaming about? The moon asked one night. Nothing, I said. Hmm, same here, said the moon. And then one of us went back to sleep. <laughs> and I will close with a poem called The Ordinary. Bring us back down to planet Earth. The Ordinary. The moment for which there is no name past. I had erased all I wanted to, maybe more than I needed to. The sunlight slanting through the trees made no promises, while around the feeder small gray birds huddled like Dickens orphans. The blue sky stretched tight as a drum above me, no clouds for Baudelaire. I could feel the medicine taking effect. My heartbeat slowed. The ordinary descended. Ordinary dew on ordinary grass, ordinary gutters, ordinary houses on ordinary streets, ordinary dogs barking, ordinary children shouting. Everything seemed so easily named. How could anyone bear it? The ordinary is allegorical, too, said the angel crouched in the briars. The gray birds lifted as one and began to circle his head. Shh, they said. Shh. Thank you. So I guess uh, we'll throw it open to questions, right? Yeah. Yeah, it should be able to hear well. Okay. Right. So uh, if anybody wants I mean, to ask a question. You don't need to even come up. Hmm? Yeah, everybody can stay where they're at and just, just, just yeah. walk into the room. Okay. Oh, I'm just going to catch it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, don't know think we have to All right. But uh, you want to question? Okay. All right. <laughs> so any questions? John. Do you eat radish? Do I eat radishes? No, I, I don't actually. I, I was never. Or never a sumac tea. Maybe. Um, but yeah, I, I was. My mom would, you know, do those 1970s mixed veggie salad things with the radishes, and I was never a partaker. Seriously, though, there's these um, things that are repetitive in this book. And I'm kind of curious, this is at the auto physics and autobiography. If you don't eat radishes, you're not supposed to do that. Unless the radishes are a symbol, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what are, are you asking, is there anything autobiographical? I have a sense there might be a little bit, yeah. Uh, your senses are good. Um, I am not a confessional poet. Uh, I, the, 
for me, the purpose of the poem is not just to express my feelings, um, but I get that stuff in there usually in disguise form, right? I think probably many of us have been on Neptune at one time or another. Um, so, you know, and, so, and a few of the other poems maybe have a little more overtly autobiographical stuff in there, but my, um, my method of composing the poems generally uh, involves trying to know as little as possible while I'm writing. I don't want any idea of where this poem's gonna go. Um, I'm kind of like raising an antenna into the darkness and waiting for signals to come in. So if I can sneak some autobiographical stuff in at some point or other, that's great. But I find the quickest way to kill a poem for me is like to have an idea and then write about it. <laughs> sometimes, I'm, you know, sometimes I'll start with the metaphor, like the Neptune idea, but, um, you know, I kind of write to find out what I'm thinking. Um, so you won't find a poem that I write called The Horse, and the whole poem's about a horse, and it makes you walk away thinking about horses. Um, for a poem that has six parts, and you wrote a poem that has many parts, uh, are you thinking that as a serial uh, progression? Yeah. Or do you mix and match? Do you just sort of put it down and see what happens? Well, as a matter of fact, um, I've just been rereading some Jack Spicer uh, over the last few days, and, and he talks about the serial poem and uh, reached the point where he was writing only serial poems, books. He said, oh, his earlier work, it was just a single poem. They felt like one night stands to him. And uh, so actually the next book, which I think I've already written, um, is all serial poems. So I'm, I'm really interested in that idea because, well, for one thing, um, as you've noticed, probably the, the poems tend to be kind of disjunctive, but when you do a series, you can have images and things come up again in new contexts. So the, uh, the poem isn't just uh, working on what uh, Roman Jakobson would call the vertical level, right, through the metaphors and the deep, deeper layers. But now you can play with those things on the horizontal axis as well. You've got contiguity as well as the metaphors. And for me, that, that brings everything to life in some pretty interesting ways. So that's kind of where I'm headed now. There's a few serial poems in here, but the next book, I think, will be entirely uh, serial poems. Yes? Um, when you're letting these ideas beam down, yeah. how do you know what's trustworthy and what's not? Um, that's where I think my reading um, and other things come into play. All right. Um, I don't think, let's put it this way, I don't think a lot of these signals would be coming through if I hadn't read the Surrealists, Poets, and read John Ashbery, and read James Tate, and so on. So I have, once the ideas are there, I have something by which to gauge them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not always right, of course, and, and, and sometimes the, the signals that come through are not trustworthy. Uh, hopefully I catch them all before you know, before I let them loose in the world. Um, piggybacking off that, what makes a surreal poem good versus bad? Now that's a really good question. Um, because you know, Breton would say, you know, we're not interested in literature and good literature. We're, we're after something deeper. And, and so, um, but I don't believe that entirely. I, I think there are good surrealist poems and and bad ones. And I guess for me, part of it is, uh, you know, in surrealism, as opposed to like the typical metaphors you find in, in a lot of other poetry, uh, in surrealism, you want the tenor and the vehicle to be pulled apart much further, right? Uh, it isn't so much the likeness, but it's also the dissimilarities that are part of the fun. And I guess a good surrealistic poem is one where there's still a spark from the tenor to the vehicle. I can't explain what makes that spark happen, but 
that's kind of intuitively what I'm doing. This is strange. This is a strange disjunction. Um, I don't what, know exactly what this has to do with this, but I feel a spark between them. It's, it's intuitive, but we are talking about surrealism. <laughs> Throughout the book, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was wondering if you have one in mind to have a character that you want to create that you think about. I haven't really thought about it in those in those terms. Uh, I mean, I guess to some extent it's I don't want to say it's me because I am, like I say, not consciously, you know always shaping these things. I do, after I've got a bunch of stuff written down, I will go back and, and revise and so on. Um, but now I'm going to have to go through and see if it's the same speaker uh, in all the poems. Um, but I guess, I guess, I guess it's, yeah, well, the, yeah, the tone is, that's probably me. That's probably part of the spark too, right? That, that makes those things connect somehow. And I have no wonderful technical explanation beyond that. Um, but I think that's probably what's going on there. Yes? You think of the kind of cloud that kind of, well, Oh, well, yeah, there's Freder uh, saying, don't. Yeah. Freder is the voice that's always saying, don't do this and don't do that. Yeah. And I, I, it's kind of the counterbalance to the Yeah. I think he's a second. Um, Summer on Neptune. Once he came up the first time, then I knew I was going to be repeating it, you know, because there there are certain ideas like what word rhymes with and manifesting and other concepts that the blueness and the, the bad vegetables and so on that you know. I wanted to keep juggling. Um, but you know, there's in a lot of my stuff. There's either a Fred or, or I think he's like a second cousin to Uncle Gestalt um, from the Lie poem too. You know, there's there's always the sort of uh, super ego character shaking a finger and accusing you of things you're probably guilty of. We actually have a, a live uh, stream question from. Uh -oh. Robin Arcus. Okay. Can you draw a connection between surrealist visual art and surrealist poetry? Hmm. Well, I'm sure there. I'm sure there is one. Um, in, in surrealist art, think of a Salvador Dali painting, right? There's all these things that don't normally go together uh, that are going together, and you have melting watches with ants crawling on them and. There's this, this strange sort of walrus-like uh, creature that's actually a self-portrait. You know, so maybe that gets to the idea of the self too. Um, so, and, and likewise, I'm throwing together a lot of incongruous things. Um, what, was, what was the saying? Like the meeting of a, an umbrella and a sewing machine on an operating table. Held, held that up as uh, something to strive for. So, um, so yeah, there are there are definitely continuities I think between the visual art and the literary art. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, you said that a lot of these ideas just kind of come to you, and they're not necessarily connected. But do you sit down like with the intention of writing? and looking for all those different ideas or do they just come to you throughout the day and you uh, put them down on paper? It's a combination. I mean, I do try to set aside time most days you know, to at least spend an hour or two staring at a blank piece of paper and waiting to see if the antenna is sufficiently raised. But yeah, sometimes during the day, someone will say something or something will happen. I'll then write it down and then return to it later and see if it's still quivering and vibrating and resonating and, you know, summoning other images too. But I think it's important to make the time for it to happen. You know, it, it doesn't always, but, uh, you know, if you're not making the time, then you 
then at that point, I'll have to use. Yes? Uh, thank you for the reading. So, something that uh, characterizes all of the poems I think we heard tonight is your, you have this, uh, your, your voice, maybe to Cindy's point, has this incredible charisma to it uh, and a great sense of humor. So I guess what I'm wondering is, we know that you're also a blues musician, but do you feel the charisma bubbling and it creates other things that we don't get to see? Or when, you, when the charisma bubbles, does it go into this real sort of? I feel the Labre tar pits bubbling. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, so or, what you ask is there a connection between the, the feelings of playing on stage and the feelings of writing or reading? I guess my question is, uh, are there different outlets beyond the surrealist poetry and blues for what I'm characterizing as your charisma that I talk to my dog a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he gives me good advice most of the time. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I teach, so hopefully once in a while uh, I'm able to get uh, a little bit going there. Um, you guys can respond to that once the camera shut off. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so I mean, I, I don't like wake up in the morning feeling charismatic. Um, in fact, I don't generally feel, I don't generally feel charismatic, but um, I do try to, you know, get myself up for a performance, you know? So I guess I, I tried to psych myself up a little bit for you know, this reading in the same way that I might for a set of blues. <laughs> Going once. <laughs> Tom, just a comment. I've seen you play quite a number of times. And I have found that the most charisma you've shown to the musician is when you have no idea what you're going to say. Well, I know what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 what you're doing. Which but, fortunately is a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> in, in, in a way, it's the same thing I was talking about the way I write. Yeah. Right? I'm improvising. As soon as I start thinking, I'm going to try this little Walter Wick from this song. It's like the piano player who's watching his fingers when he plays. You know, it, uh, I mean, it usually does not. I, 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 I can remember myself shaking my head, and you, not the song, you, uh, but you were in the pocket of blues music. You're, you're, you're gone the flow to state. yourself, and you're in the flow of whatever is unfolding. Yeah. Anyway, that's what I've observed over the years. Well, I think I think that flow states where most of the magic happens, mm -hmm. right? Whether you're playing music or uh, writing a poem or, or or even doing a painting, actually. So, so I wish you all happy flow states. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, stay tuned. Uh, Cindy Bay's book will be the next one out on Doubly Mad Press, and it's going to be a great book. Uh, yeah. Just wait and see. <laughs> well, if that's it, then uh, I'm feeling slightly harsh. Yeah. <laughs> Yay.